This is the Lynn calling. And I'd just like to say that when the Lynn calls, it pays to listen. This is how Mildred Killers, notoriously known as Axis Sally, began her Nazi propaganda radio broadcast during World War II. Her programs were heard not only by the US soldiers stationed in Europe, but also by the Americans back home. She mainly targeted US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and the Jewish people. A defeat for Germany would mean a defeat for America, she said. I said, damn Roosevelt and Churchill and all of the Jews who made this war possible. Mildred Gillers, born on November 29, 1900, in Portland, led a life marked by unexpected twists and turns. Raised in a world that was gradually succumbing to the shadows of World War II, Gillers initially found herself drawn to the career in arts. Pursuing her passion, she immersed herself in acting, envisioning a life on a stage. However, she gave up this dream when she failed to find regular employment. Gillers' initial pursuits took an unexpected turn as she moved to Europe, a continent on the brink of conflict. The exact circumstances leading to her relocation remain somewhat shrouded in mystery. Little did she know that this decision would lead her to a role that history would find both perplexing and controversial. As Europe became a stage for the unfolding drama of World War II, Mildred Gillers unwittingly became a character in this historical narrative, setting the stage for her later involvement in the dark world of wartime propaganda. In these tumultuous times, Mildred Gillers found herself in Germany, a country undergoing a radical transformation under Nazi rule. Her story, initially one of personal exploration, would soon become intertwined with the larger tapestry of global conflict. Join us as we explore how this woman with a dream of stage would find herself at the center of a wartime drama, eventually taking on the infamous role of Axis Sally and becoming the first woman ever convicted of treason by the United States. As the geopolitical landscape shifted and war loomed over Europe, Mildred Gillers found herself adopting a role that would forever define her legacy. Axis Sally a persona that would become synonymous with the chilling voice behind radio broadcasts aimed at demoralizing American troops stationed abroad. On 6th May 1940, Mildred Gillers was hired as an American announcer on the German radio network, introducing various entertainment programs displaying an inborn natural talent for live broadcasting. In 1941, The US State Department recommended that American nationals depart from Germany and areas under German control. Despite this advisory, Killers made the decision to stay due to her fiance Paul Carlson, who had become a naturalized German citizen. Carlson insisted he would not marry her if she returned to the United States. Unfortunately, shortly after this choice, Carlson was deployed to the Eastern Front and tragically lost his life in the combat. but for some reason she still chose to stay in germany and continue her employment gillers initial broadcast were largely a political eventually she started a relationship with max otto kuschwitz the german american program director in the us zone at the rrg in 1942 kuschwitz casted gillers in a new show called home sweet home and included her in his political broadcast This is where the journey of Mildred Gillers truly began and she transformed into Axis Sally. For nearly 5 years, she became the highest paid announcer on the German Foreign Ministry's overseas service. In a short time, Gillers earned various nicknames from her GI audience, such as the Bitch of Berlin, Berlin Babe, Olga, and Sally. However, the most prevalent and enduring nickname was Axis Sally. This particular name likely originated when during an on-air self-description Killers identified herself as the Irish type, a real Sally. This name caught on and became a symbol for German propaganda. Her most notable radio broadcast was Home Sweet Home, which ran from 24 December 1942 to 1945. This regular propaganda program aimed to evoke homesickness among US forces in Europe. 
The broadcast focused on themes of soldiers, wives and sweethearts being unfaithful during their deployment, questioning their loyalty, especially if the soldiers were injured. Opening with a train whistle sound, Home Sweet Home sought to exploit American soldiers' fears about events on the home front, casting doubt on their mission, leadership and post-war prospects. Another broadcast was Mitch at the Mic, which ran from March to late fall 1943. This broadcast featured American songs mixed with defeatist propaganda, anti-Semitic rhetoric and attacks on Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The program aimed to undermine morale and promote negative sentiments among the listeners. Another broadcast was GI's Letterbox and Medical Report. It was directed at the US home audience in 1944. These broadcasts utilized information on wounded and captured US airmen to instill fear and worry in their families. After D-Day, Englers and Koschwitz worked from France, whilst deposing as representatives of the International Red Cross. They visited hospitals and interviewed prisoners of war and toured prisoner of war camps in Germany in 1943. The interviews were edited to convey a false impression that captured Americans were well-treated or sympathetic to the Nazi cause, adding to the misinformation campaign. Gillers gained notoriety for her most famous podcast on May 11, 1944, just weeks before the D-Day invasion of Normandy. The radio play, Vision of Invasion, written by Max Otto Koschwitz and performed by Mildred Gillers, portrayed a dramatic and harrowing scenario. In this podcast, Gillers played the role of Evelyn, a fictional mother from Ohio. The storyline unfolded as Evelyn had a dream in which her son met a horrific fate during an attempted invasion of occupied Europe. Specifically, the narrative suggested that Evelyn's son had died in a gruesome manner on a ship in English Channel. This broadcast aired on May 11, 1944, just before the D-Day invasion of Normandy. It was intended to exploit the fears and emotions of American soldiers by depicting a nightmarish vision of the potential consequences of the impending invasion. The goal was to demoralize and instill fear among the US forces. Soldiers on ground and people back home both listened to her programs. But one key listening post in the States was the US Federal Communications Commission's monitoring facility at the Silver Hill, Maryland, which duly recorded as much of it as possible for an expected post-war judicial reckoning when the Nazis lost. It was this particular broadcast, among the 10 post-war charges of treason, that led to her conviction and imprisonment for treason against the United States. After Koshwitz's passing in August 1944, Killer's broadcast experienced a decline in quality, becoming uninspired and repetitious without his creative influence. Despite this, she stayed in Berlin until the conclusion of the war. Killer's delivered her final broadcast on May 6, 1945, a mere two days before Germany surrendered. This marked the culmination of her broadcasting activities as wartime era came to an end. As we dive deeper into the nefarious world of Axis Sally's broadcast, it's crucial to understand the insidious tactics she employed in her psychological warfare. Her broadcasts weren't merely anti-American, they were a sophisticated blend of disinformation and psychological manipulation aimed at eroding the morale of Allied forces. Axis Sally, with her honeyed voice, skillfully played on the emotions and doubts of American soldiers as well as the audience back in the United States. Her messages were carefully crafted to create a sense of disillusionment, questioning the purpose and legitimacy of their mission. This wasn't just propaganda, it was an attempt to unravel the mental fabric that held the troops together. Her broadcasts often conveyed a false sense of familiarity, attempting to make the soldiers feel detached from their own cause. She questioned the sincerity of their loved ones back home insinuating that the sacrifices made on the battlefield were neither appreciated nor reciprocated. While overt propaganda aimed at boosting the morale of one's own troops is common in wartime, Axis Sally took a different approach. Her broadcasts were a weaponized form of doubt, strategically chipping away at the mental resilience of those in the front lines. The goal was to create a rift in the emotional connection between the enemy soldiers and their sense of purpose. The psychological toll of war is already immense, but Axis Sally added an extra layer of complexity, 
as soldiers grappled with the physical challenges of combat her broadcast infiltrated their minds planting seeds of uncertainty that would take root long after the war had ended as world war 2 reached its conclusion the allies turned their attention to those responsible for spreading nazi propaganda and mildred killers found herself in the spotlight the us attorney general took decisive action by sending prosecutor victor c warheide to berlin with the mission of locating and apprehending killers warheide along with counter intelligence corps special agent hans winzen had a singular lead raymond kurtz a b17 pilot who had been shot down by the germans He recalled that a woman using the alias Barbara Moom and claiming to be the broadcaster Mitch at the mic had sought the interviews at his prison camp. Warheide immediately initiated the distribution of wanted posters featuring Glers image throughout the Berlin. A breakthrough came when information surfaced that a woman identifying as Barbara Moom was selling furniture at the second-hand markets across the city. Upon detaining the shop owner who happened to have a table belonging to Glers and subjecting him to intensive interrogation he disclosed killer's address which led to her arrest on 15th march 1946 following her arrest killer's was held by the counter intelligence corps at camp king alongside collaborators herbert john bergman and donald s day she remained in military custody until her conditional release on december 24 1946 but surprisingly she chose not to leave detention voluntarily Despite this initial release, she was unexpectedly rearrested in January 1947 at the request of US Justice Department. Eventually, on 21st August 1948, she was flown to the United States to await trial on charges related to aiding the German war effort. She faced indictment on September 10, 1948 with 8 counts of treason which commenced on 25th January 1949. The prosecution presented a substantial amount of her recorded programs courtesy of the Federal Communications Commission in Silver Hill to establish her active involvement in propaganda activities targeting the United States. Additionally, evidence indicated that Killers had sworn allegiance to Adolf Hitler. For this, it was told to the court that after Pearl Harbor, Killers castigated off air the Third Reich's ally Japan, jeopardizing both her job and her freedom from incarceration in concentration camp as she was investigated by the Gestapo. It was at this point that she took the oath of loyalty to Hitler and thus was allowed to continue on air, doing record announcements and chatty shows as an American national disc jockey. At trial, she steadfastly maintained that she was always a patriotic American. She said, my war was with England and the Jews, denying that she had ever wanted America to lose the war. Her lawyers asserted that her broadcasts expressed unpopular opinions but did not amount to treasonable conduct. They also argued that she was under the hypnotic influence of Quaschwitz and therefore not entirely accountable for her actions until after his death. The trial's most important moment unfolded when Gillers faced a dramatic confrontation with one of the former prisoners of war she had interviewed, Gunnar Dreckschalt. While on the witness stand, he passionately exclaimed and pointed his finger at her, declaring, She threatened us as she left. that american citizen that woman right there she threatened us this emotional testimony added a compelling and vivid dimension to the proceedings emphasizing the impact of killer's propaganda on those who had been directly subjected to it during her time on the witness stand gillers steadfastly defended her actions maintaining her stance on everything she had done she asserted that she was a paid performer and vehemently denied the label of traitor Gillers stood by her position that her role was that of a performer rather than someone engaged in treasonous activities. On 10th March 1949, the jury convicted Gillers on a single count of treason, specifically for the vision of invasion broadcast. She received a sentence of 10 to 30 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. The judge opted for a less severe sentence considering that she had not participated in high-level Nazi propaganda policy conferences as was the case with individuals like Douglas Chandler and Robert Henry Best. In 1950, the US Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia affirmed the conviction. Gillers co-prisoner and fellow enemy radio announcer 
known as Tokyo Rose, applied for and was granted a presidential pardon, leading to her release in January 1956. In contrast, Killers never sought nor received a pardon. When she became eligible for regular parole at the age of 58 in March 1959, she chose not to apply. She feared potential physical harm in the United States and the prospect of being deported to the new Federal Republic of Germany. Additionally, she reasoned that without a job or any financial resources, she had nowhere else to go. The situation took a positive turn after Gillers underwent a religious conversion. Following this transformation, the Our Lady of Pentelum Convent in Columbus, Ohio extended a job offer to her. The position involved teaching music to novice nuns at the nearby St. Joseph Academy upon her release. In exchange for her services, Gillers received free room and board, residing within the convent along with a monthly salary of $30. As time passed, Gillers expanded her teaching role at the Our Lady of Pentelum Convent. In addition to music, she taught the novice nuns French and German, piano, drama, and choral music. Her dedication and contributions were recognized with salary increases, at times reaching as much as $100 a month. Beyond her convent duties, she extended her teaching to provide piano lessons to inner-city children on Saturdays. A renowned biographer Richard Lucas noted this phase of her ongoing journey to redemption, stating, in her final role, she was respected, needed, valued, and even beloved. Gillers chose to surround herself with books and art in her modest home. Despite her past, she declined all further interviews, bringing her 30 years of supervision to a close in 1979. Her history remained largely unknown to her students, friends, and neighbors. In 1988, at the age of 87 and diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer, Killers passed away. Her death occurred on June 25th and there was no public funeral. Friends were present at her burial in an unmarked grave in Lockbourne, Ohio. This ended the story of one of the most notorious World War II war propagandist, Mildred Killers, or infamously known as Excess Sally. As we conclude this chapter on Access Sally, let us carry forward the lessons embedded in her story. The lessons about the power of media, the moral quandaries of wartime, and the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. We will see you with another video. Till then, do like, share and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you don't miss more such videos.